Romans 10, 1 through 13. The key to God's past dealings with Israel has been his sovereignty. The key to his present dealings is with their salvation. Today, God is offering salvation to the Jew on exactly the same terms as to the Gentile or to us. And he makes no national difference at all. Israel is still God's chosen people. God birthed them. God has had his hand on them all through the years. He still has his hand on them. He still has a purpose for them. But anyone that wants to be saved is saved the same way. Same way. Today it is not the Jew nor the Gentile, but the church, which is the channel of blessing for mankind. The church is the one. The, the, the Jewish nation, God birthed them and had a purpose for them was to get the news out about their God, and they failed. And now the church has been birthed, and the church is to get the message of God out. The church is to get the gospel out. As I prayed just a moment ago, our world, the one thing that our world needs more than anything else is Jesus. Amen. Jesus can change all of the problems that we have today. But you see, what we have done, we have legislated God out of everything in our world. We've legislated God out of our schools. Uh, I mean, when I went to school, I had a Methodist minister that was my fourth and fifth and, and I think sixth grade school teacher. I know fourth and fifth. And he probably wasn't supposed to do it, but he opened his Bible every morning and read the scripture to us. And I think it helped us. It did not hurt us. But see, we can't do that today. They don't want the Bible in our schools. We don't want the Bible in our government. We don't the, want the Bible in our families. We don't want some, some churches don't even want the Bible in them. But Jesus is the answer. And the church is to be getting Jesus out in this world. If a Jew today wants to come to come into God's favor, he must come to Calvary as every other lost sinner. Amen. There is this is the theme of Romans 10. I told you years ago I preached back in the 90s I preached through this book of Romans and I told you about a minister that was a good he's a good friend of mine still is today. Uh, and uh, me, he and I were doing a wedding together, and he was of a different, he was preaching of a different faith and of a works salvation church. And I was telling him, I said, you know, I, I, I'm preaching through the book of Romans. And he said, well, so am I. I said, how in the world are you preaching through the book of Romans in your church when it is justification by faith and not by works? He said, well, that's why I've been there so long. They just let me preach what I want to. <laughs> but it was kind of funny because I never thought about him preaching through the book of Romans because I'm sure he had to skip some of these verses because they're pretty plain. But this is the theme of Romans 10. The first point I want you to see is Christ revealed as Savior. Nationally, the Jew has rejected Jesus of Nazareth, and this has invoked the curse of God upon this nation. And Matthew 27, verse 25 says, And all the people answered and said, His blood be on us and on our children. Individually, the Jew needs to recognize his lost condition the same as anyone else and become part of the remnant, become part of the saved of this world. And let me say, I say that remnant, and I want you to hear me. We think that heaven's going to be full of masses of people. But listen, the Bible says, All them that call me Lord, Lord shall not enter in. 
only those who do the will of my Father which is in heaven. And the Bible says there is two roads. One is a wide road and many go thereby. And then there is the narrow road which leads to life. And it says few enter in thereby. We think sometimes, I guess, when Jesus comes back that it's going to be just a mass exodus. I really think it will be a remnant exodus from this earth. Individually, we all must come to Jesus Christ the same way. Salvation through Christ and Christ alone. Paul wastes no words in coming to grips with the problem which faces every Jew then and today. He plainly says, and this is my next point, the Jew is lost. But in saying this, he begins, brethren. Now, I think, I think Paul was kind of a loud mouth like me, or even worse, maybe. My mouth has got me in trouble most of my life, and Paul's mouth got him in trouble most of his life. <laughs> but here, I think we see a little softer tone in the Apostle Paul when he says to them, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that you may be saved. Paul may, he, he may be using a more gentle tone, but he is not watering down the fact that the Jew is lost and needs Jesus. You and I need to stand firm, and maybe we need to use a more gentle voice and a gentle way of telling this world that you are lost and you need Jesus. Paul here is saying brethren because he's writing this to the Roman church and pretty much really pointing out to the Jew, but he's, he's writing to the Roman church that was full of Jews and Gentiles. And he's saying to these Jews, he said, I'm including you with everybody else that is within that church. My heart's desire and prayer for every one of you is to be saved. My heart's desire and prayer for our nation today is that we fall on our faces and come to the realization that we need Jesus more than we need anything else. Amen. And then the next point, why the Jew is lost. Paul spells out two basic reasons why the Jew is lost. Reasons which apply in a general sense to the Gentiles also. The Jew was lost because, first of all, his misguided religious exercise. Verse 2 there, look at it. It says, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. The Jews certainly were, were zealous in their devotion to God and the practice of the law. I mean, they, 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 they knew the law. They studied the law. They tried to be obedient to the law. I never will forget while studying over in Israel and walking down through the old city and you see a lot of those Orthodox Jews and, and them, uh, them teaching these new, these new young converts or these young people. And they, they always had these chairs that the, the, the rabbi would set up on the top. And then the, the one that he was teaching would be facing him and sitting lower. And he would be teaching them the word, teaching him the word. And then you walk down the streets there and these people had these, uh, all uh, Jews must have a lot of money because all of them had AirPods. And the, the, the Torah is just being run through their heads all the time. And they're, they're, just, they're just listening to it, listening to it, getting it, getting it in, their, in their heads. Let me say this to it. A lot of us have a lot of head knowledge of the Scripture. But head knowledge is not what's going to get you to heaven. 
He says, For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. The, Paul knew that, that from his own experience, they were so busy trying to keep the law being obedient to the law, that by keeping the law, they did not understand what God really wanted for them. This was exactly Paul's statement when he confronted King Agrippa later in later years and testified, and, and I, these, these verses will come up on the screen, Acts 26, 9 through 11. He says, Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. This also I did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they, when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them, and I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them even to foreign cities. Paul is, is, is telling, telling these folks, he said, just like I had done in my life, you are zealous to keep the law. You are religious. But that is not what's going to get you in a right relationship with Christ. And then he goes on, and, and while he was uh, imprisoned in Rome, he's writing back to, the church, to his friends in Philippi, and he's, he's telling them about his unconverted days there in Philippians 3, 4 through 7. He said, Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. He said, and he gives the reasons why. He said, circumcised in the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which was in the law, blameless, but what things were gained to me, these I have counted as loss in Christ. Paul come to realize that all of these things he was doing profited him nothing. Profited him no nothing. They were really loss to him. They were a hindrance to him. And we have folks today that are going to churches where they're, they are practicing ritualism and they think the rituals are going to get them to heaven. My wife is teaching this Bible study class on Mondays and she has women of all different faiths from all over the world that are coming to this Bible study class. Some of them have never read the Bible before in their lives. And some think they're all right because they've been through the ritualism of their religion. They've been through all of those things that their religion requires of them and that they're all right with God. And one lady, she'd never written, and Carmelita bought her a Bible, and, and, she, and, and she told, the lady, and told her, she said, I'm reading it now. I'm reading it now. They, a lot of church, a lot, a lot of ritualistic churches, they don't read the Bible. I worked with one guy for five years back, years and years ago. And I just tried to get him to read the Bible. And he wouldn't read the Bible because they wouldn't let him read the Bible. And if somebody, if you find somebody like that, if you can get them to read the book of John, the book of John will change their heart. But Paul said, all of this stuff I've done in my past, and I've probably, I've probably been more zealous toward it than even you. But I found out that it was not a help. It was a loss to me. He said before his conversion, he said, I had a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Even though he had received the finest religious Bible-centered education possible in his day, head knowledge is not enough. Head knowledge is not enough. You've got to have a heart knowledge. 
a heart knowledge. There's a certain town in Canada. It has a, it, it's, it's at a crossroads. It has a road heading north, which heads toward the Alaskan Highway. It has a road leading south toward the American border. It has a, a road leading east toward the Rockies and comes to an abrupt dead end. And then it has a road leading to the west, which leads to the Pacific coast. This person that, that is they're, they're standing in this city, in this town in Canada, and they, they're thinking, I want to go to America. And they're looking around at all four of these roads, and they choose the road that looks best to them. They did, they've not gotten any directions in how to get to America. They're just choosing the road that looks best to them. And they get on the northbound road. And they are like a lot of folks that drive around here. They're in a hurry to get to their destination. And the faster they go, the farther they get away from their destination. Why? Because they're on the wrong road. They're on the wrong road. You can do all kinds of works. You can give all kinds of stuff. But it's the wrong road. You and I must get on the road leading to Jesus. Proverbs 14, 12 said, There is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. I told you about this friend I have that comes by and talks to me all the time. He's a works salvation guy. And uh, I, I get so tickled at him because he, he just quotes these scriptures and quotes these scriptures. And, and then I ask him, what, well, what do you do with this verse? And what do you do with these verses? And what do you do with these? Well, I, and then he goes back to these. I said, have you ever just took your verses in the context of the entire Bible? And not just pull them out and make them say what you want them to say. The Bible, the, the Bible from beginning to end is all about Christ. All about Christ. Yeah, we, we can choose a way. But if it's not the right way, then it's not leading us in the direction we need to go. The Jew is lost not only because of his misguided religious exercise, but because of his misguided religious enterprise. Look at verses 3 and 4. It says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. The great enterprise of the Jew was to achieve God's righteousness by observing the laws and the rituals. And let me say this to you. It is utterly impossible. Righteousness is not to be found at Sinai, but at Calvary. It lies not in the acceptance of a precept, but the acceptance of a person. Not in servitude to commandments, but in submission to Christ. To submit to God's righteousness means to lay aside our own righteousness and acknowledge our complete failure. You know, many people think they're too good to be saved. Many people think they're too good to be lost. That's why, that's why it's hard for men to get saved, because we're never lost. We know where we're going. It may take us two hours longer to get there, but we know where we're going. But you, you will never ha get anyone saved until they realize they're lost. 
That's what's wrong with our world today because we have been preaching this health and wealth and prosperity gospel through the years. And they think that's the way to God. And they don't even, they don't realize that what they need, what they have is, is, is really not a profit to them. It is a loss. And you can't live right. You cannot live according to the law. This is something the Jew and all religious persons generally refuse to do, and that is acknowledge Christ as the only way. Christ is the only way. But without much submission, a person is not only lost, but inexcusably lost, because Christ has been revealed as Savior. People won't accept. You know, I don't know how many folks I've witnessed to through the years, and, and, and I've, t I've taught soul-winning classes. I, I don't know how many and how many times. But you, know, you, 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 you go in and you share the gospel with people, and you share the gospel with people, and you share the gospel with people, and it, look, and it seems like they're just dead. They, they don't receive it. They don't hear it. They don't understand it. their way and their way is not the right way Jesus' way is the only way the second point I want to make in verses 5 through 13 Christ received as Savior Paul next shows that there is something that precedes an acceptance of Christ and something that follows it an acceptance of Christ is preceded by considering Christ as Savior. Considering Christ as Savior. Before pointing us away to Calvary, Paul would have us to take a last look at Sinai and consider the new problem with acquiring righteousness by the law. Look what he says there in verse 5. For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. And he says, the man who does those things shall live by them. Now, this is a quotation from Leviticus 18.5 in the Old Testament. And he points, in order to be saved by the law, a person must live according to every one of those laws. Who is it in this place right here is been obedient to all of the Ten Commandments? You served them all perfectly. You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> Even your preacher standing here, I cannot say that I've done it. Nobody. Should a person be able to do this? No. But he says, the man who does these things shall live by them. It is cold comfort for a person who realizes he can't do it. This underlines the problem of the law because nobody can live such a perfect life. It's not the law that must, must appeal to, that we must appeal to for righteousness. Paul says that, and he's talking to the Jews there of the church of Rome. He said, it is to Jesus you need to appeal to. It's not Moses, it's Christ. It is the very one that the Israelites have rejected, and they still reject today. And then notice in verses 6 and 7, he says, But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above. Or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. That quotation is from Deuteronomy 30. And Paul is saying, just as Moses had said, that you, there, there was no need for anyone to go up to heaven to bring down the law. So it is true that no one needs to go up to heaven to bring down the Messiah. 
And just as Moses said that there is no need for anyone to go across the sea to find the law, so no one need to search the depths of, of the, uh, uh, the depths to find the, the Scripture. He says there in verse 8, but what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. Just as in Moses' day, the word was most accessible. The Lord is most accessible today. That includes the whole message of the gospel with its glorious tidings that Christ has come down from heaven and has ascended from the regions of the dead. This is the two greatest miracles of the Christian faith, the incarnation, which tells us that Christ has come down from heaven, and the resurrection, which tells us that he come up from the grave. They only have to be believed. Just believed. I've told God this many times, God, let me sell Jesus to people. I think I could get them to buy him. But he wants us to give him away. It's free. And when you share with people the gospel message, I've had, I've had this told me I don't know how many times, there's got to be more to it than that. I prayed, God, why didn't you make it harder? Maybe they'd understood it better. But you see, he wanted to make it simple and easy. You only have to believe in your heart. The word of faith is most accessible. But then the Savior is most accessible. But then the Savior is most accessible too, as in verse 9 it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. The emphasis is on Jesus as Lord. That's another reason why we don't want Jesus in our lives, because we don't want him in control of our lives. We want to do what we want to do. And if it's all right with me, then it's all right with everybody. The emphasis is also on righteousness by faith in contrast to righteousness by works. You just have to accept it by faith. At the heart of the gospel message is the resounding victorious assertion concerning the Lord Jesus. And yes, he came to this world to, and went to the cross to die for you and for me. And those Romans crucified him. And they put him in a tomb and sealed it and placed guards by it so that he couldn't get out. But Paul is saying here today, and I'm saying here today, that he arose from the grave. In 1 Corinthians 15, 5, Paul writes, He was seen by Cephas. He was seen by over 500 brethren. He was seen by James and then by the apostles. And then the apostle Paul said, And he is also seen by me. I saw him on the Damascus Road. Simple. Believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. And Paul says you can be saved. The gospel appeal is primarily to the heart and not to the head. Carmelie and I were talking about some Bible passages not long ago. And I looked at her and I said, that little brain in your head, and it's small. It cannot comprehend the infinite mind of God. We, you know, we, we want to. We, 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 we study the Scripture and we, we, we read the Scriptures and we want to try to bring it down to some level where, where we can understand it, where we can comprehend it, and you'll never do it. You just have to believe it. Believe it. It's not head knowledge, it's heart knowledge. The Hebrew 
thought the heart comprised the whole man. And it does. When you receive Jesus Christ into your heart, He changes the whole person. The whole person. Again, verse 9, if, thou will, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be. You don't have to hope, but you will be saved. The Savior must be accessible. He must be believed on in the heart and confessed with the mouth. This is one of the one things the Jews refuse to do, and they still refuse to do it today. They still refuse to confess Jesus as Lord. Such a confession is one lasting evidence that conversion has taken place in your soul. The confession seems to be both Godward and manward. Paul has more to say about this in these next verses. And this is my next point, confessing Christ as Savior. The value of confessing Christ is it gives personal expression to the Lordship of Christ. You go back over there in that 1 Corinthian passage and Paul says, tells about all these folks that have seen him, seen the resurrected Lord. And then he says, oh, and I have seen him too. Verse 10 says, For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. There is a change in order in the order of heart and mouth here because verse 9 follows, follows Moses' order and verse 10, uh, the order of experience. Believing comes before confessing. It is not something that, we must, that must be done in order to be saved. Once you believe, you will want to confess him. You'll want everybody to know. It's a natural consequence of true faith. Because Matthew 12, 34 says, Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I never, I've never gotten over my salvation experience. I couldn't hardly wait to get back home and tell my folks I received Jesus tonight. And I went, I used to play football. We played football out in the summer, played football out in the, in the fields and all, and all those boys I played football with. And one of them was a, was a preacher's son. We, I got them all together, and I said, you'll never guess what happened to me Friday night. They said, no, what happened to you? I said, I got saved. I asked Jesus in my heart. I never will forget one of them. One of them said, so what? So what? But I couldn't, I couldn't keep from telling people because I had Jesus in my heart. Thus salvation is revealed into, into its two elements, a heart trust that pro provokes a true confession. Once you receive Him and you get Him in your heart, you're going to confess it. Neither are these components described in such a way that a person might accomplish one without accomplishing the other. One cannot be saved without being justified, nor justified without being saved. The first value, then, in giving personal expression to the Lordship of Christ lies in the fact that it is revealing of faith. Doubtless this takes place Godward first in the heart but second values lies in the fact that once you're saved, it gives an audible expression. You're going to tell folks. Now this does not mean, as the King James implies, that the believer will not be ashamed of confessing Christ before men. The King James says there in verse 11, Whosoever believeth in him shall not be ashamed. The newer translations get it right. It says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. And J.B. Phillips renders it will not be disappointed. Whoever believes on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will not be disappointed. He will not let you down. 
He draws attention to the fact that Christ is Lord of all. Verse 12, it says, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. And Paul makes this statement because earlier on he made the statement that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Jew and Gentile. And now he's, he's saying salvation is for the Jew and the Gentile. All can be saved. And then Paul points out that Jesus is Lord of all. He says in verse 13, For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Could the gospel get any plainer than that right there? Let me read that to you again because it went right over some of you. See. <laughs> For whoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Anyone can call. Jew or Gentile, poor or rich, educated or uneducated, it doesn't matter. Whosoever will may come. Whosoever will can call. It doesn't matter who you are. I am so glad God put it that way that we can't buy our way, we can't do our way, we can't give our way. We just have to surrender our way. Get the white flag out and say, God, I've been trying all this time. I just give up. I just give up. And I guarantee you, before you get the words out of your mouth, he's in your heart. I've never asked anyone to follow me in a sinner's prayer. And I, anyone that I've taught how to lead someone to the Lord, I, I always told them, don't, don't do that. Because if anyone really means business with the Lord, they can ask the Lord to save them like anybody else. And they don't have to have, I tell them, you don't have to use no religious words or church words. I think I told you not long ago about a guy I led to the Lord, and, and he told me, he said, well, I don't know how to pray. I said, praying is just like asking your wife to bring you a glass of tea. I said, how do you do that? He said, I'm just, Lou, bring me some tea. I said, then you just ask the Lord to do for you what you want him to do. I never have forgotten his prayer. Such a blessing to me, a man that said he could not pray and told the Lord he had, he had been a sinner for a long time. And Lord, thank you for sending this old preacher by to tell me about Jesus. And he said, Jesus, will you please save me? I think before he ever got those words out, God had him. Are you trying to get to, sound, get to Jesus by any other means than believing? It will not work. Paul writing back to these Romans, he wanted them to get it right. He wanted them, he taught them about the sovereignty of God. He wanted them to understand that. And now he wants them to understand that salvation is not by obedience to the law or obedience to the ritual, but it's obedience to the Lord, submitting to him and giving your whole life and being to him. If you're not there to get, you can be today. For now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation.